Hello everyone, this is Yours Trivia, and today we're continuing the second rebellion of Huainan. Let's talk lore series with episode 2, titled A Rush Start. Before we get started, here's the answer to our trivia question from the end of our last episode. And be sure to stay tuned until the end of this episode for a brand new trivia question. Now last time we introduced the new civil and military partnership in the Yang province in Wenqing and Guanqiujian, and their first task together would be the defense of Hefei against Zhuge Ke's massive invasion with 200,000 troops. Initially, both Guanqiujian and Wenqing wanted to reinforce Hefei right away, but the central government held them back and ordered them to stay defensive, as Hefei Castle was left to fend for itself for over 90 days before Sima Fu and the Wei reinforcement of over 200,000 troops arrived to easily defeat an exhausted Wu army that was plagued by a widespread illness. In this route, Wen Qing once again overreported his achievements by stating that his unit killed over 10,000 Wu troops. But by this time, Sima Shi was long used to Wen Qing's habit of overreporting, as Wen Qing's demand for the appropriate level of reward was simply denied, leading to Wen Qing's growing frustration with Sima Shi's court. But this reason alone would not be enough to spark a rebellion as Wen Qing's eventual motivation will largely come from greed and personal affection for Guan Qiujian, who would ultimately be the one to plot the second rebellion of Huainan. Now, Guan Qiujian's motivation is much easier to understand. Politically, Guan Qiujian started his career as Cao Rui's peer tutor long before Cao Rui became emperor. So Guan Qiujian and Cao Rui's relationship was much more tight-knit and friendlier than the typical subject and lord relationship. On top of this, the peer tutelage experience allowed Guan Qiujian to become a well-respected scholar and poet, which allowed him to befriend the likes of Cao Zhi and Xia Hu Xuan. So given Guan Qiujian's numerous ties with the imperial clan, he was a Wei loyalist through and through. And thus, ever since Sima Yi's coup, Guan Qiujian had kept his eyes on the Sima clan, even though at the time he was still stuck in the frontier northeastern province of Yu. Now reassigned to the turbulent Yang province, Guan Qiujian finally had the means to act, especially as two events in the year 254 would become the final straws that broke the camel's back. First in March of 254, Li Feng's failed coup and assassination attempt against Sima Shi came to light as the resulting mass execution of co-conspirators, including Guan Qiujian's good friend and well-respected scholar Xia Hu Xuan. Then in September of the same year, Sima Shi forced the abdication of Cao Rui's adopted son and heir, Emperor Cao Feng, replacing him with Cao Rui's nephew, Cao Mao. When this happened, Guan Qiujian's eldest son, Guan Qiudian, who was serving as an imperial court official in the capital city of Luoyang as more or less a political hostage, wrote a private letter to his father with only one sentence stating that, Father, you are entrusted by the kingdom with the powers to defend its borders. Yet now as the kingdom collapses from within, if you continue to just watch without using your powers to counter this internal threat, then be prepared to be blamed by everyone from the four seas. Essentially, Guan Qiudian was telling his father to not worry about his safety and just rebel as the dire political situation warranted his action. And thus, in January of 255, as a comet streaked across the sky in Huainan, burning brightly towards the northwest, Guan Qiudian decided to interpret this as a divine omen of his imminent march against Luoyang as plans for the rebellion went into motion. First, Guan Qiujian easily secured the support of his civil counterpart in the Yang province in Wenqing, who, as we mentioned before, has become good friends with Guan Qiujian and was also rather displeased with Sima Shi for denying him his military rewards. The second step of Guan Qiujian's plan was to secure the support of Zhuge Dan, who was the military commander of the Yu province garrison that bordered the Yang province to the west. Guan Qiujian initially thought that this would be an easy alliance to secure because Zhuge Dan was a former Cao Shuang appointee and most likely secretly supported Wang Ling's rebellion before the plot fell apart. 
On top of that, both Guan Qiujie and Zhuge Dan were well-respected scholars and had been good friends with Xia Houxuan, who had just been executed by Sima Shi. So by all accounts, Zhuge Dan should have joined Guan Qiujie's rebellion. However, what Guan Qiujie could not account for is Zhuge Dan's hatred for Wen Qing. So with Wen Qing also taking part in Guan Qiujie's rebellion, Zhuge Dan not only declined Guan Qiujie's invitation, he ended up executing Guan Qiujian's messenger, publicly denounced Guan Qiujian's treasonous act, and most importantly, reported him to Sima Shi and the central government. Knowing that he had lost his element of surprise, Guan Qiujian knew he had to act decisively. So immediately after Zhuge Dan's betrayal, Guan Qiujian gathered all the garrison officers and mid-level commanders inside the Yang province to the capital city of Shouchun, where he would take all their family members hostage to secure their loyalty. Then in a public initiation to the rebellion, Guan Qiujian constructed an altar on the west side of Shouchun, where he, along with all the garrison officers, took a blood oath to restore Wei, as after a quick round of rushed conscription within the province, an army of 60,000 troops marched out of the Yang province towards the capital city of Luoyang, as the second rebellion of Huainan hastily got underway in what would become the first civil war of the Wei dynasty. Now before we jump into the fighting, allow me to explain some of Guan Qiujian's actions here. First off, given the rush start to the rebellion due to Zhuge Dan's unexpected betrayal, Guan Qiujian knew he had only access to the 50,000 garrison forces within the Yang province. Now, typically, around 20% of that garrison force would be off-duty at any given time, as border garrisons were always made of conscripts who were on rotation. So, in reality, the available force to Guan Qiujian would be just 40,000 troops. Furthermore, to prevent regional rebellions, it had always been the policy of the Wei court to assign only conscripts from other provinces, so the vast majority of these 40,000 troops available to Guan Qiujian would be non-Yang province troops, and therefore their families would still be residing inside Wei controlled territories, with most of them in the north. Now, the only exception to this rule would be the officers, who would oftentimes be allowed to have their families with them as officers were not rotated like conscripts. So, Guan Qiujian knew he needed to control these officers first through their families. But in addition to this, in order to make sure that they would remain loyal to him, he also set up the altar to have them publicly commit to the rebellion through this blood oath, as this move basically made it impossible for them to back out in the future. At this ceremony, Guan Qiujian also claimed that he had a letter from Empress Dowager Guo as a means to justify his rebellion as a righteous act to save the Wei dynasty instead of a usurpation attempt. But it is largely believed this letter was forged as Empress Dowager Guo was a close ally to the Sima clan and played a key role in the selection of the new emperor, Cao Mao. And therefore, most of the regional commanders ended up dismissing Guan Qiujian's claim for no one else in the kingdom would rally to Guan Qiujian's cause even though he had sent messengers with this forged letter to all of them. Now, to bolster his force of mostly non-native troops, Guan Qiujian most likely conscripted 20 to 30,000 fresh conscripts from within the Yang province before setting march, as he also would have to leave behind most of his elderly troops to help defend Shouchun and keep an eye on the families of the officers while he set march for Luoyang with roughly 60,000 troops. Lastly, and most importantly, to provide a reason and to outline an objective for his rebellion, Guan Qiujian made a grand public declaration of Sima Shi's crimes, which is pretty typical, but Guan Qiujian's declaration was very smartly crafted. First, Guan Qiujian praised Sima Yi's regency and Sima Yi's effort in guiding Emperor Cao Feng to contrast that with Sima Shi's actions in Cao Feng's abdication as both being disloyal to the Wei dynasty and also being unfaithful to his father's wishes. And in a Confucian society, 
this was casting Sima Shi as an unfilial pious son. Guan Qiujian also goes on to praise Sima Shi's uncle, Sima Fu, as a loyal servant of Wei, who tearfully sent off Emperor Cao Fang to his new home in the princedom of Qi, and how Sima Fu should take over Sima Shi's control of the Wei Central Army. Furthermore, Guan Qiujian also praised Sima Shi's younger brother, Sima Zhou, as a better son of Sima Yi and someone he would support to become the new regent in Sima Shi's place, as he encouraged Sima Fu and Sima Zhou to follow the examples of other notable historical figures of the past who deposed the unfit relative for the greater good of the country. In a sense, Guan Qiujian was publicly framing his rebellion not as a personal power grab, as he outlined his goals to only removing Sima Shi, who in Guan Qiujian's word was not only a bad regent, but also a bad son of the Sima clan. And in Sima Shi's place, Guan Qiujian publicly supported both Sima Fu and Sima Zhou, not because Guan Qiujian genuinely believed that Sima Fu and Sima Zhou were loyal and faithful servants of Wei. But by doing so, Guan Qiujian effectively limited Sima Shi's response to his rebellion by sowing the slightest reason of doubt within Sima Shi's mind. What I mean by this is that for Sima Shi to retain power in the Wei court, he needed to ensure the constant control over the emperor and thus the court. To achieve this control, Sima Shi personally commanded the Wei Central Army. So previously, when there was a military operation outside of the capital, such as the attack on Dongxing and the reinforcement of Hefei, Sima Shi had always personally stayed behind in the capital, while sending out his key relatives, such as his younger brother Sima Zhao in the case of the Battle of Dongxing, and his uncle Sima Fu in the case of reinforcement at Hefei. But now, with Guan Qiujian's public declaration, Sima Shi and many of his key advisors felt uneasy with the idea of handing over the command of a large army now over to either Sima Fu or Sima Zhao, as now there was this non-zero chance that they would turn on Sima Shi and join forces with Guan Qiujian. Well, you might think this is highly unlikely, when we're talking about the potential to take control of an entire kingdom for yourself and for your particular branch of the clan, people have betrayed family for much less. So after consulting with his two key advisors in Fu Gu and Wang Su, Sima Shi finally decided to personally lead the Wei army, as only with the military under his own control can Sima Shi feel secure about his own position. But this was a physically tough ordeal for Sima Shi, as he had just had surgery on his face to remove a large tumor growing under one of his eyes. But war waits for no one, as Sima Shi would set march for what would become his final campaign. And to find out the battle that would define the Second Rebellion of Huainan, come back next time as we'll continue our series tomorrow with episode 3, titled Lenyang's Raid. So hopefully you all have enjoyed this episode enough to consider subscribing to the channel for more content on Three Kingdoms history, or simply support the channel by leaving a comment below, or just by hitting the like button. And as always, I'll see you all next time. Bye!